Let's go. Let's try to do 10 plus 5. Or 10 plus 0. 10 plus 0. 10 plus 5 against Dan LM. Okay, here we go. We're doing 10 plus 5, so a bit of a compromise between 15 plus 10 and 10 plus 0. Okay, so we're facing the Nimsevich opening, which is knight c6. And knight c6, in most cases, has fairly little, what is called in chess, independent value. You'll hear this phrase in opening books, and basically that means if an opening has little independent value, then it generally transposes into another opening. Now, if white plays d4, then you get an independent opening. But it's much easier and more convenient to play knight f3 here, because most of the time, black plays e5, and then you don't have to learn a separate opening. We can just play our normal stuff. Okay, I think I'm in the mood for another Belgrade Gambit. Um, I'm in the mood for another Belgrade Gambit. Let's go for it and see how it holds up at a relatively high level. Let's go knight c3. Now, so far, we've played the four knight scotch, and we've played the Vienna. Of course, you cannot play the Vienna if you play two knight f3, black plays e5. So that is the one downside is the Vienna has been eliminated. Let's see how the Belgrade Gambit fares at this level. Let's go d4. Probably black is going to take. Now, we have also faced the move bishop d4, which is kind of a bishop b4, which is kind of an old move, which is an old move. And I will not remember how to play against it. I remember bishop b4, we played d5, which is apparently wrong. So if he plays bishop b4, we will try to recollect the theory. I think bishop b4, knight takes e5 was the line. Okay, ed4, and of course the Belgrade Gambit, which is knight d5, which we've already played once. So I'll insert the link, if you're watching on YouTube, I'll put the link to our previous Belgrade Gambit game. In that game, yeah, we faced, we faced, I think, the immediate d6. I'll check. I'll check what we faced in the previous Belgrade game. Now, knight b4 essentially tells me that black knows what he's doing. Black knows what they're doing if he plays knight b4. Uh, because this is a move which is commonly recommended, I guess, in books, and the engine likes this move. But when I was analyzing the Belgrade, I found that white has a very interesting weapon, which doesn't look like anything special, but I think it rejuvenates the line. So against knight b4, you take the knight on f6. And first of all, against queen takes f6, God forbid, do not take on d4. Obviously, because there's a simple tactic, queen takes d4, queen takes d4, knight c takes c2, picks up the piece. So we need to chase the knight away with a3. And now you play, okay, the knight has to drop back to c6. It's the only reasonable square. And in this position, there is this like, I, I hesitate to call it a computer move because it is just a developing move. But there are some subtleties behind this move that must be understood for this move to be appreciated. And I've played this in, in uh, casual blitz and stuff. So if you watch my stream often, you, you, this might be familiar to you. If you're looking at this for the first time with white, first of all, it may seem like there's no good way to reclaim the pawn. And it is true. You're basically playing this gambit style. Um, you will only reclaim the pawn if black plays the move d6. So our goal is to meet d6 with the move bishop to b5. But for the time being, we still need to develop our bishop. So we play this move bishop d3, which is kind of a flexible move. And what this move signals to you is that we are not trying to actively win this pawn back. Unless black black plays d6, then we play bishop b5, which is a very convenient move. And the reason it's a very convenient move is because it pins the knight, and now we are ready to recapture this pawn, hopefully with a small advantage. Now, black has a computer line here that gives black a good position, but I have encountered maybe one GM who's played this, and he is playing all of the top computer moves here. Queen takes d4. And here the computer line is bishop e7. In all of my experience playing online, maybe like two or three people have played like this. It's very, very rare to know this line. And it's not like black is better in the sense that, oh, you know, um, white has nothing to play for. And you see he plays queen takes d4 and we get into an endgame. And this endgame, I think, is very pleasant for white. And I really like that we get an endgame because we haven't had that many endgames, like longer endgames in the speedrun. So I really can try to dig deep and, and try to explain how I try to outplay good players in the end game. Not that I'm particularly good at it, but I'll do my best. So of course the end game should be equal here, but maybe white has a smidge. I think we are just a tiny bit better. Why are we a tiny bit better? Well, there's two reasons. The first is we have slightly better control of the center, but the main reason is that after we capture on C6 and we have to decide what we're capturing with, we will somewhat damage black's queen side pawn structure. We can play bishop takes C6, or we can play knight takes c6. We don't have to take on c6. We can play this move bishop e3, just keeping the status quo, which is also a reasonable move, but I don't like it. Um, I think we should take the opportunity to damage black's pawn structure. And I think we should do it with the knight. 
this may be less appealing to you because BC now comes with a tempo, but I don't want to just hand over the bishop pair just like that. I, I don't want to hand over the bishop pair, and I don't want to hand over uncontested control of the light squares. So, for example, if we had taken with the bishop after BC, black would be able to play C5 and chase this knight out of the center, and then maybe even F5 expanding on the king side. So I like the concept of leaving the bishops on the board. And here we have another choice. And all of these decisions that we're about to make are not essential. They are not essential in the sense that if you make the wrong move here, you're screwed. I absolutely don't think that. I think that you just need to follow your intuition and not spend too long on these calls. First, let's play bishop d3. I liked the look of bishop a6, but after bishop a6, rook b8, it felt to me that this bishop was not doing enough. And it was also not supporting the e4 pawn, which is one of the main sort of elements of our position. So it makes sense for this pawn to be well protected. Now, this bishop may look bad to you, but okay, remember that a piece can play a defensive role, and that doesn't mean it's a bad piece. So don't be dismissive about the fact that, oh, the bishop's not controlling squares, therefore it's a bad bishop. Not really. And I'll, bishop c4 I didn't like because of bishop e6, and we want to avoid trades if possible. Now let's continue our development. So let's consider where we put this bishop. I like the look of bishop e3 in order to put some pressure on the a7 pawn. Let's go bishop e3. We are not committing to the placement of our king just yet, which is a deliberate by design because I don't know what black is going to do. So depending on how black is going to position their pieces, I'm going to decide whether we're going king side or queen side or staying in the center, which is also possible because it's the end game. But I don't think so. I think my flaw, there are a little bit too many pieces here for us to stay in the center. I would be a little bit worried if we stayed in the center that black would put a rook on e8 and we would start pressuring us. So, okay, so this is a good case in point. Bishop f6. So we have a move here that simultaneously develop, develops our king and protects this b2 pawn. And I think it's worth taking this opportunity. Castle queen side. This also puts the rook on a nice square, right? d1 square. And what is the rook on d1 doing? Well, it's x-raying the bishop. And you have to realize already at this stage, I'll say that this endgame cannot be won quickly. Black is way too solid for you to expect that we're going to develop a winning advantage in five moves. We're probably not even going to develop a winning advantage in 10 moves, maybe at all. You have to play very gradually. You have to make small improving moves. And you have to be okay with settling in for a long endgame. So first thing is like a mentality issue. Rook b8. Okay. There is a funny trick where we can play bishop a7, but the problem is black has bishop takes b2 check. If rook takes b2, we would have this move e5 there, but it's a moot point. Okay, so we can go b3, we can go c3. b3 actually doesn't look as bad. I don't think it's as bad as it looks. You know what the, what the plus side of b3 is? So after we play b3, black is likely to play a5, I think, to de develop, uh, defend the pawn. And then we can build this up this pawn chain with a4. And the benefit of the move a4 is that it fixes black's pawn on a dark square. And one of the things that we want to do in this end game is create long-term weaknesses. The more long-term weaknesses we create, the, the better you know our, our long-term chances become. Um, we can also play c3, which also has the major benefit of blunting this bishop and, and reducing the influence of black's bishop. So both b3 and c3 make sense. I don't like b4 as much. I feel like that's a little bit too committal. I, although, you know, b4 also a case could be made for that move. b3, bishop, c3 is a little bit issue, scary. Yeah, that's what worries me. Okay. Hmm. I don't know what to play here. Let me think. b3, bishop, c3... It's annoying, but we have ways to deal with it. We can play bishop e2 and rook d3, for example. Very, very hard decision. Very hard decision. The problem also with c3 is that we create a long-term weakness. Yeah, let's go b3. Let's go b3. Let's go b3. By the way, this is not my intuition. I'm going against my intuition. My intuition is to play c3. Like in a bullet game, I'd play c3 for sure. But I feel like when I approach this more deeply, I want to avoid creating long-term weaknesses of our own. And... One of the deciding factors for me against c3, okay, we go a4 and we fix the pawn, is that when we play c3, the b2 pawn becomes a long-term weakness. And black has this plan that involves doubling rooks on the b file and applying pressure on it, which I don't really want to allow. Here, our pawns on the queen side are very healthy. Now, we should keep in mind that there is a very typical plan in such structures that should be, we should be very vigilant about trying to either prevent or take this thing out of. In some situations, does anybody know how this pawn structure can be dealt with by black in, in some situations? Yeah, so there's this typical plan which involves trying to break apart 
uh, the pawn chain, right? And you're probably familiar with the general concept of breaking apart a pawn chain. Here, Black could try to advance the pawn to c4. Not right now, but in general. And if we have to play b takes c4, then we get our own weakness on a4, and the b file opens up. Okay, bishop c3 play. All right. So here, I really like the concept of bishop c4 and rook d3. Let's do it. Bishop c4 and rook d3, trying to smoke the bishop out of c3. Now, you might say, well, why didn't we play bishop d2? But trading dark squared bishops is not preferable because then the a5 pawn will be unattackable and you want to avoid unattackable weaknesses we have to try to keep our dark squared bishop alive in order to be able later on in the game to attack the, the weakness on a5 um, and bishop e6 right is what i was worried about previously but here bishop e6 we could even play rook d3 straight away using some nice little tactics because then if black plays bishop c4 we play rook c3 and we skewer the bishop to the c pawn so bishop e6 rook d3 Okay, black can play bishop b4, but then the bishop is out of the game. And we can try to keep the bishop out of the game. If the bishop goes back, let's say, to e5 or f6, and already we can take on e6 and try to go bishop d2 and try to tie down the rook to a8. And when we tie down a piece, we can then start playing on the other side of the board with the understanding that our opponent doesn't have sufficient resources to address whatever's happening on the other side because we're tying him down to a long-term weakness on the queen side. Okay, so already I like, the, I like the way this game is going. I like the progress that we're making here. And we're posing some difficult decisions to black. Okay, rook d3, he, bishop e6. Okay, now rook d3. And this is even trickier, right? Because we're, we're giving him a chance to make a tactical error. Bishop takes c4. We play rook takes c3. And we win the c6 pawn. And remember the key rule. When we've got opposite colored bishops, it, it, the opposite colored bishop positions are not drawn with rooks on the board. Uh, so you should you should not be worried about that at all. All right, let's think. So we have to take. Okay, so king b2 almost, man, tempo for tempo, black survives this. c4 is interesting, but I don't like it. c3, bishop a3, king c2, d5, wow. Honestly, I overlooked that sequence. Still think white is better, though. Okay, think, think, think. Bishop d4 is possible. Defend black castles again. Don't like it. Hmm. I think king b2. We have to play this very slowly. Ah, I have an idea. Okay. I think we should begin. Ah, but that, that, uh -huh. Yes, I think we should go king b2 for starters. I don't like f4 in this. I mean, th this gets very subtle. Th this, this is going to get very positional. And when I say that, you know, what do I mean by that? I mean, it's a lot of what, what I'm about to do is based on like understanding piece placement, and it's not based on variation. So when you ask a question in the post-game analysis too, don't expect me to say, oh, the reason I didn't do this is because of X, Y, and Z. A lot of this has to do with my feeling of where the pieces belong and where we can maximize our advantage. So D5, F3, this is actually the reason why I did not want to push F4. I wanted to reserve the possibility of defending the pawn with F3. Now, I'm seeing two things. This bishop on b4 is pissing me off. But playing the move c3 is a very bad idea because not only do we soften up our b3 pawn, but we, we will no longer be able to play bishop to d2 and attack the a5 pawn. So my idea is to switch from attacking the a5 pawn to piling up on the second weakness that black has, which is the c6 pawn. I'm liking the look of bishop to d2 eventually in order to try to trade off the bishop so that we can eventually put a rook on c3 and attack black down the c-file. But to do all of that, we need to bring all our pieces into the game. So let's start with rook h to d1, which is sort of like a neutral move. I want to see what black ends up doing here. Um, we're not attacking the d5 pawn. That's not the point of this move. We're just sort of generally bringing the rook into the game, okay? And I'm trying to prevent black from expanding on the queen side with c5 or e5 by preemptively piling up on the d-pawn. So we're trying to immobilize black's pawn structure so i believe that white is better here but not much i think it's a slight edge for us and if black plays well he should draw this but it's a difficult position for black to play because he's got a lot of weaknesses he's got these weaknesses on the queen side we've got a super compact pawn structure with no weaknesses and we've got a lot of ways that we can try to improve our position here h6 now here the idea that i was mentioning earlier is bishop d2 how does bishop d2 work? Well, when we play bishop d2 and black trades on d2, we then reserve the possibility of playing rook c3 and sticking the rook on this prime real estate on c5. So I really think bishop d2 is a worthy 
worthy try. But the drawback of bishop d2 is that black can take and stick the rook on the second rank, rook f2. And we have to address that concretely. But I think that concretely works out for us. Let's quickly go bishop d2 and see. Let's, let's pose this problem to black. And the way we're trying to play is also to pose a lot of decisions and dilemmas for black. Which, given the clock situation, is a very unpleasant way of playing. Okay, so we're playing bishop d2. Okay, he doesn't react. Doesn't react. But can't we now take? Yeah, I think we should take now. Yeah, we should definitely take. Okay, and now now we our plan has succeeded. And we can try to attack this c6 pawn with the move rook c3. And try to get the rook to c5. And then maybe even try to get the other rook to c3. And then we really start massaging black's weaknesses. You know, really gets unpleasant there. Now, of course, why am I not worried, you might wonder, about d takes e4? Because I'm intuitively just understanding that black has three pawns. We can pick off all of them. And black will only at most be able to take the e4 pawn. So I'm not even really calculating d takes e4. I am assuming that rook b6 here is absolutely forced. Then let's go rook c5 because that's a pretty automatic move. It's not going to hurt us to attack another weakness on a5. Still, I think the position is not much better for us. I think we're still within the realm of slightly better. But the situation is starting to shift, and Black is losing the thread of the game. You can feel it. He cooperated. He basically cooperated with us. And by cooperating with us, he's given us everything that we want. And now I think Rook A6 is another mistake. I think it was better to play Rook A8. Now I'm asking myself the question, first of all, what happens if we play Rook D3? And I'm rejecting this move because Black is in time to get his king over to D7. And then our rooks are just sort of staring at the pawn. We need to create more weaknesses. We need to apply the principle, not necessarily of two weaknesses, but the principle of more weaknesses. And we need to ask ourselves, okay, can we open up another theater of the game? And the answer is yes. Let's start with e takes d5. Let's start with e takes d5. If cd, then we win the pawn and we're grooving. And now we can break apart the pawn chain with c4. And the point of c4 is, first of all, to remove this pawn on d5, which is restricting our rook. And second of all, to open up more prospects for our rooks. So c4 is kind of a no-brainer move. It should be logical. It should be a logical move to you. It should strike you as logical because when black takes, our rook on d1 has a lot better prospects. And we're threatening rook d7 there. At this point, I think white is much, much better. Maybe even technically winning already. Maybe even technically winning. But to win this is actually very difficult because it's a rook end game. And rook end games one mistake and you accidentally let your opponent get active and you know i don't need to, to lecture you on this this is a known fact yeah it's coming together nicely here and our opponent i think is sensing that that the game is slipping away from him, so he's giving up a pawn well i will oblige i will take it yeah and king d6 i saw this line so here we have a choice of two two options the first is maybe a move that he missed, which is rook takes c6 check. And we reach a technical position as a result where we're up a pawn. We have a three on two. And we should probably be able to convert that into a win. But we should briefly check if there's anything better. And the only other move is rook d to c1. c takes d5, rook takes c7. That hits the g7 pawn. That's a more tactical way of playing. That's a, a more ambitious way of playing, I think. Um, trying to win with both rooks on the board. It's kind of hard to say which is the better option here. Let me think. I think both options are very appealing, obviously. But more calculation is required in the in the latter option. Okay, let's go with the uh let's go with the calmer option, rook c6 dc. And now our general plan is to do two things. First of all, we need to monitor the activity of our pieces. And mo probably we should start with king c3. But maybe even not. Maybe we should start with the move rook e1. You know why? Because if we play king c3, then black will play this annoying little move, rook e8. And black will constantly be threatening to, to infiltrate with, with his rook to e2. Now, if we start with the move rook to e1, black can, of course, play rook to d8 and probably will. But then we can bring our king up to c3 and we've got the perfect setup. Because we are essentially very safely and securely controlling all of the infiltration squares. And then we can work on stage 2 or phase 2 of our plan. And phase two of our plan is to start very carefully and judiciously advancing our kingside pawns with two aims in mind. Of course, to create a pass pawn eventually, but also to restrict the activity of Black's Rook and to soften up Black's pawns. Okay, so I think we should go rookie four for starters and, and centralize our Rook. Let's centralize our Rook. Also, we're potentially preparing b4. 
And why is b4 good? Because b4 creates an outside passer. Okay, so we can play king c3 here first, but then maybe black will play c5. So we have an important, very important moment. If we want to play b4, we should do it now. If we don't, then it's fine to go king c3. And I think we don't. I think we're okay going king c3 here. I don't mind him going c5. Yeah, let's go king c3. Because if black plays c5, I feel like the pawn on a5 will be a long-term weakness. And rather than trading it, we can actually try to win it with our rook. We can try to win it by going around with our rook. And we can also go into b5 with our king. So c5 weakens the queen side quite a bit. And I'm just it's just not a scary move. If he attacks the h-pawn, we can defend it very easily. We can play h4. That's partially why we put the rook on e4. We can even play h3. It doesn't matter. Rook g5, we can play g4. So this frontal attack on our pawns is never going to lead to success. Okay, now again we can play b4. And this time it's a lot more appealing with our king a little bit more active. But I don't see a reason why we cannot start by locking up black's pawns here with h4. Maybe I allowed g5. Maybe that was a bad idea. I don't know. But then maybe b4 already. Yeah, g5. Probably a mistake by me to allow g5. Probably a mistake, but maybe not. Maybe just b4 and we win. Yeah, I think just b4. Let's go b4. Let's go. Let's create the passer. Why am I creating a passer now? Well, my logic is this. After the trade, we're going to take with our king to keep our king as active as possible. And we will already be very close to being able to play a5 and starting to promote our a pawn. But I'm also looking over at the king side and I'm saying, okay, if black plays g takes h4, we play rook takes h4. And then we will be very, very close to creating another pass pawn on the king side. And if we get two pass pawns on both sides of the board with a minute on the clock, I mean, if black defends this, kudos. Okay, here we go. We already have a passer and here's a second one. We have two passers on both sides of the board. This has to be winning. This has to be winning. But how do we actually convert this? Check here. What if we push? Should we push? Should we push now or should we push later? We can also push f4, by the way, and then try to walk our king up to c4 and b4. But I don't like that idea. It's not easy. Not easy at all to convert this. a5 is probably a mistake. Okay. Go like this. Now go king c4. Ryan's rook g5. This guy is very good. Yeah, I might be losing the thread a little bit here, but I still think we're winning. G4, maybe. Yeah, let's go g4. And now rook g4. And I should be winning here. This should be winning. This should be winning, but it's going to be hard to convert. It should be winning, I think, practically speaking, because we have two passers and black is only one. But he's playing this. I have to commend our opponent. He's playing this incredibly well. But still, I mean, king d3. Okay, check probably. Or maybe, aha. Uh -huh. Maybe we can play like this and cut off the king, essentially. Trying to cut off the king here. Cut off the king. Man, I mean, if he defends this, I'll be very impressed. <sighs> Nicely done. Yeah, for rookie one. I mean, this is all correct, I think, of our opponent. Let's try rookie four. I'm going to torture black here. Now, I feel like this is a draw. And very confidently, too. Like, I feel like I got... I'm getting outplayed. Out, out, out understanding here. But still very difficult, because we're going to start playing f4. We're going to start playing f4. Okay, king b6. Let's go, f4. Man, it's still very hard to hold this. Very hard to hold. And I have some really tricky ideas. Like, if he plays c5, I think he loses. I think if he plays c5, he loses. Most people would play c5 here. I mean, this is like an automatic move. Yeah, check. I think we win now. Check. And then rook back to e5. Yeah, I think we win now. No, no, I think he played incredibly well, but I, I think this is just a good endgame player. Mm, is it winning takes? Okay, we have him cut off. This should be a win. We have him cut off. This should be winning. Okay, f5. Yeah, this should be winning. It's a Lucina position. It's basically a Lucina position. Yeah, this is classic. This is a Lucina position. Shuvalova, yeah. The, there was a game in the in the Women's World Cup where this exact endgame was featured today. This is really interesting. And this is... Okay, it's not even a Lucina. Black is so freaking cut off that Black is not even close to, to accessing this pawn. And we basically just push the pawn. We basically just push the pawn. Check. Black starts checking us from behind. It doesn't matter. We go 
ba the basic idea here is you go to F8. You go to F8, you push F7, and then you get a Lucina. But you don't even need the Lucina. Let me think. What is the easiest way to win this? Let me think for a second. The easiest way to win this is not even to use the Lucina. It's to go rook e8. It's to go rook e8 and then king e7. Because we can basically make our way out of the checks through c5. Yeah, you don't even need the Lucina method here. You just you just draw it. You just win easily. Yeah, king e7 and that's it. You can go either way. You can go like this. You can go like this. But the basic thing to understand is the pawn defends the rook. And all you need to do is zigzag your way out of the checks. The only thing to avoid here is, of course, to step onto f4 with your king. You can go to e5, although I wouldn't do this. But you can go to e5. Just don't go to f4. Because then black plays rook f1 check and wins the pawn. So like you can, the best thing to do is to go down the c file, etc. And this is resignable. I think I misplayed the endgame initially. And then I found this really cool idea, rook e6, rook e5. There's a lot to talk about in this game a lot to talk about so let's delve in really a lot to talk about okay Thanks. gg our opponent played incredibly well i think i played very well too i think this is a very high level game now generally when you play positional games like this the accuracy is going to be on the lower side because the moves are very open-ended it's 87.8 so pretty good Okay, it was it was a it was a good game. I think there were a lot of inaccuracies by both of us, but overall, I'm very happy with that game. Okay, because this was a ten plus five game, I apologize if I didn't explain stuff thoroughly during the game, but I will do that now. Let me pull up chess base here, and I'm gonna pull up the chat on my phone. Yeah, so many cool ideas in this game that will be easier to understand if you're experienced in the end game. Like, if you have no experience in these types of end games, you're like, how did you come up with this? How did you come up with this? How did you know about that? All of it is understandable. You just need experience. Okay, so we play the Belgrade Gambit. Anyway, I don't remember what we faced the first game. I think it might have been Bishop C5. Uh, but, you know, I'll, I'll have the link in the chat uh, in the description. Knight B4 is... Yeah, this is one of the top engine recommendations. Oh, before we uh, go into this, of course, our opponent started with Knight C6 and we played Knight F3. So here the only independent move is d5. And hopefully I explained independent value well. So the majority of people play e5 here. The only serious independent move is d5. Against d5, I think the way that I like to play is takes, takes, knight c3. This is an, an inferior scandy because black has this very awkward move. And against queen a5, you immediately punish black by playing bishop b5, bishop d7, and d4. This is a very bad position for black. There are some theory, There is some theory here, like black can castle quickly, and this can be a little bit scary. But in this version, it's a very bad line. A6, I think you play bishop c6, bishop c6, knight e5. I analyzed this recently. And the basic idea is you're hitting c6 and f7. Black has to go like this. And you initiate the queen side attack with b4. b4 is a very thematic move. And queen f3. And you're winning. Because rook b1 is threatened and you're attacking b7. Yeah, b oh, d6 is also an independent move. No, d6 transposes to the perk. I usually, usually when black plays d6... You transpose into a line of the perk where black plays knight c6. This is what I mean. Now, when I used to play this with black, I would, in fact, start with knight c6. Yeah. So there is this line of the perk where black plays d6. True. And this is a big line, so I don't have time to talk about this right now. But the basic idea is you go d4. Uh, you go knight f3, sorry. Or sorry, knight f3, d6, d4. And typically, if black plays it the way Magnus likes to play it, it's knight f6, knight c3, g6. And here, I think... The line, the best line is to play bishop e3, bishop g7, and queen d2. Very traditional style. And if black castles, then you play d5. Grandelius played this against me. Knight b8 and bishop h6. This position is theoretical and it's better for white. This is uh, what I really like against the system. And I, it's very unpleasant. Typically, black chips away at the center with c6 and white castles queen side. You can check this out with the engine on your own. This is just a direction I would point you in. Also remember that in such positions, you're never afraid of knight g4. This is a very common misconception. Knight g4 is not scary because you can play either bishop f4 or bishop g5, actually. Um, bishop g5. Typically, black plays h6. And you can play a bunch of different moves, but you can just play bishop h4. And, like, this is not scary. And black plays g5, and, and black runs out of tempo moves. And then later on, you can play the move h4 and really smash at uh, black's very weak pawns on g5. So this is not scary. There are positions where knight g4 is scary, but this is not one of them. 
generally positions where the pawn is already on h6, you should take knight g4 more seriously. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is a brief overview of the alternative options. In this game, we transpose to a Belgrade Gambit, and black plays knight b4. Okay, fantastic. So against knight b4, knight f6 is the only serious move. And after queen f6, uh, the main line, the old main line, is this move bishop c4. And I don't know what the current theoretical standing of this move is. I checked this with the engine and didn't love it because black plays bishop c5. And there are some very exciting lines here. There's There are some very exciting lines, like you castle. If black castles, this is a very bad move. Who can tell me why it is a bad idea for black to castle? This is a subtle point, but it's a very instructive point. Why should black have to start with d6? Here white is already better. It's because of e5. And it makes it very hard for black to develop their queen side. So for instance, look at this position. Uh, this has happened in several games. Generally, black plays like this. You play this very powerful move, a3. And the point is, if knight takes c2, then there's bishop d3 forking the queen and the knight. So you force the knight back to c6. And uh, here you play rook e1. And uh, you just get a big initiative here. Because when black plays d6, you can play bishop d3. And you start pushing black around. Now let's see who can find the best move here for white. There is a very important move here for white, without which this whole sequence wouldn't work. Because if you just take, well, black takes to the bishop, black is up a pawn, and we have nothing to show for it. But we strike at the other side of b4, and you will see this move commonly in the Belgrade. You force the bishop back. Of course, now you take, and black's pawn structure is completely ruined, and you can de develop the bishop or develop the bishop and attack d6. White has an initiative and a great position. For instance, let's say black plays d5. Now we strike with b5. And uh, already black is in huge trouble. Just look at this. Bishop d6, rook e5, I mean, knight g5. Like, this is why the Belgrade can be really fun to play. Because the pieces have a lot of active potential. Devil up the bishop, yeah. So, for this reason, black has to, has, has to know to play d6. And you can still play e5. This is the main line. This is the main line. Bishop g5. Pawn takes bishop g5, queen f5. Rook e1 attacking the e5 pawn. Black has to know to play the cold-blooded bishop d6, c3, and here black has to know a very nice trick. If black plays dc, pause the video and figure out what happens. What happens here? What happens? What does white do? Does white just play bc? No, white plays rook e5 out of nowhere. Anytime you have this construction, you should be aware that this is a, a mating idea. If black plays knight c6, then cd and white is grooving. This is amazing for white. You're going to go bishop d3 and queen g4. You have rook e4, and white is a big initiative. Unfortunately, black has a very devilish idea. Black can castle. And you should understand very quickly what the point is. Cb e4. And black recovers the piece with a small advantage. Because if the knight moves, then you take the bishop. Now, white can go knight c4, queen g5, rook e4, and it's equal. Or actually, the engine gives knight d2 here. I put knight d2 here and knight e4. This is the way to equalize. Queen e5 takes, takes rook e4. And black has, white has some compensation for the pawn because the queen can come out to f3. This should be equal. So this is a very good alternative line. You can play this line as well because black has to know a lot after bishop c4. Um, now, bishop c5 is not the only option here. And there's a lot of theory in this very sharp line, d5. ED bishop g4. This is another very sharp line. You can do some analysis on your own. I know there's a chessable course on the Belgrade. I don't know what the author recommends. It might be bishop c4. But I decided to play this in a somewhat more technical way because this is a less known concept. a3, knight c6, bishop d3. So here there are two basic ways that black can develop their pieces. Of course, black can play bishop c5. And as I've already indicated, you almost always meet bishop c5 with b4. Bishop drops back to b6. You castle. And uh, typically, black plays d6. And now you play b5. You force this knight to commit to a square. If knight a5, then you should already know what the trick is. You play e5 and bishop g5 with a huge initiative, then knight takes e5. Okay? Black, of course, should play knight e5. Now you take it. Very counterintuitive, unless you understand the idea. And the idea is to immediately begin the kingside initiative with this very powerful move, f4. And white gets excellent compensation for the pawn. So if black doesn't react, then you push f5, and suddenly the bishop is out of the game. Let's say black pretends that nothing is the matter. Queen h5. 
Now you're threatening bishop g5 and f6. And if black plays h6, then rook f3. And white is mating. This is just completely winning right off the bat. So it's really nice, this idea of f4, f5. And uh, it's not easy to meet. Because if black plays e takes f4, you play bishop takes f4. Okay, probably black has to move the queen away. And now uh, you can play a4, just solidifying the situation on the queen side. Castles e5. And, I mean, just look at this. Queen h5 is coming, and it's a oh, white is already better. So I really, really like this line. I think this b4, b5, b4, castles, b5 idea is super cool. Um, if black refrains from d6 and castles himself, then b5 is even better. Because here in this version, white plays f4. And very instructive moment in this position. Okay, let's say queen e7. What do you think white should do? What would you play here intuitively? What do you think white should do? This is a bit of a, a trick question. But what do you think white should do? Yeah, so there is e5 and there is f5. The correct move is actually, I think, counterintuitive. It's f5. When I look at this position as a intermediate player, I'm thinking, and I'm not saying this by any means to condescend, like this is a reasonable way of thinking about it. So I want to open up my bishop. Let's go e5. The problem with the move e5 is that black always has this d6 move. And when the center opens up, it's very hard to devote your attention to the king side. So you can make this one move threat, queen h5. Oh my gosh, apparently, according to the engine, white has a crazy idea here. But this is just a one move threat. Apparently, in this position, so I stand corrected. I stand corrected. Black has to go d5. If black plays d6, there is a sexy idea. f5 anyway. And if black plays de, you should understand where this is going. You just throw this pawn into f6. Black takes it, and bang, and bang, and bang with a rook lift and a mate. Just, again, look how quickly these attacks just result in victory. If black plays queen takes e5, then you play this slower move, queen g4. And the point is after black develops, you just go bishop f4. Black plays queen back to f6. You play bishop g5, rook e1, bishop f6, queen g5 and mate on g7. Really, really sick lines. And notice this, queen g4, moves like these, you should not be afraid to play. Why do you, how do you know that you can play a slower move? Because black is, black is not threatening anything. Everything is protected. So you have the ability to accumulate your initiative with moves like queen g4. Of course, you could play f6 here, but this, this, this is not quite as powerful because of g6, okay? And here, f6 makes contact with the queen, so black has to react to this move. Okay, so this is bishop c5. Our opponent played d6. Now we go bishop b5. Yeah, bishop g4 is good. Uh, bishop d7 is also possible. Some people play like this. And here we go bishop g5, queen g6, bishop takes e7. I really like this position. And I've talked about this. I remember we had this position in the previous speedrun, in the analysis section. And here you can play bishop c6, bishop c6, and now knight h4. I showed this move in the previous speedrun. This knight h4, knight f5 idea is really powerful. Obviously, queen e4, there's rook e1. Queen f6, you go knight e5. And you can go, for instance, um, queen d3, rook e1. And eventually, you recover the pawn with a small advantage. So, in any case, this is um, bishop d7. Our opponent, to his great credit, knew to play bishop g4. And now play queen takes d4. Inaccuracy. Correct would be bishop e7. This is one of the best lines against the Danish. And black is not like much better, but it's like a tiny, tiny edge for it. So here's how the line goes. Essentially, white has no better move than just to take the queen. And here, compared to the uh, end game that we had, obviously it's an, it's an improved version for black. White is supposed to go c3, and black goes queenside. White goes bishop e3, and black very quickly deploys all of his pieces into the center, forcing us to play this relatively passive move, bishop d3. And now, for instance, d5, e takes d5. This is equal. Like, white has made a couple of careful moves. And here, white equalizes with castle's queen side. But, yeah, I mean, this this line is is pretty much a killer, bishop e7. Uh, the point is, if, if white castles, then black can play bishop takes f3. And here, you have to trade queens and play gf, and this is not a desirable structure. Of course, if black plays bishop f3 here then we are able to also ruin black structure, and that changes the picture. That, that means it's a different story. So remember, if you want to play this with black, go bishop e7, and uh, this neutralizes the line. 
e5 is another attempt to open up a discovered attack on the bishop, but simply queen e6 protects the bishop, and the pawn on e5 is a sitting duck because bishop takes f3 is also threatened. So anyways, we could spend like forever on this end game, but I don't want to spend too long on any individual decision. I want to talk about it in more broad strokes. So first of all, um, I explained during the game my decision to play knight takes c6. I, I don't think bishop c6 makes any sense because the knight is not a very good piece here because it's going to be chased away with the move c5. So this to me is a pretty much a no-brainer, right? No, uh, knight takes c6. I'm going to copy this into chess space so I can, so I can look at some, some games of the engine. So bc. First point that I want to reiterate is that the price of a move, and you'll hear this phrase sometimes, the price of a move is not very high. So you might look at this in the engine and see, okay, the engine gives approximately equivalent evals to bishop a6, bishop d3, and bishop c2. That's because truly the moves, there is not such a big difference between those moves. Some of you were suggesting bishop a6. It's an interesting move, and I should have given it more credit probably because you, you, you literally blockade the a-pawn. But to me, it seemed a little bit too awkward, just a little bit. Okay, so instead we decided to go back to d3, sort of a more defensive move. Bishop e7, bishop e3, bishop f6 castles. I think this stretch makes perfect sense, and b3 is the top engine move, actually. So here I was able to override my intuition and make, I think, a much more challenging move. Why, again, did I not play c3? Because after c3, c5, for instance, b2 is a long-term target that black can ultimately attack by doubling rooks on the b-file. So I just didn't see a downside to the move b3. Here black can, of course, also play c5. And what would we have done if black had played c5? Well, here I saw a very aggressive idea that involves going f4. And what do we do if black castles? Who can tell me a very interesting, an interesting move that creates some tension? An interesting move that creates some tension. And just give me a moment. Not f5. I don't like f5. I don't like f5. I don't like g4 because you've already traded queens. Don't give up your pawn like that. e5. Yeah, the move e5 is very challenging for black. Because if black takes, then it's easy to see. Well, you can just play bishop c5 and a7 hangs. This is out of the question. So black has to go like this. And now, what's a good move just to keep the tension? Just keep the tension. Rook h1. And black has a pretty unenviable situation. Black is cramped. We have good pieces. And we keep going. It's again, it's not earth, it's nothing earth shattering. I think it is, though, a slightly better position. Let's check what the engine gives. The engine gives, I'm going to turn Stockfish on and see what, what it gives in this position because I'm pretty sure f4 is a very good move. Whoa, okay, queen d4. Da, 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 da. Yeah, the engine gives um, c5, f4 is the top move, castles. Top move according to the engine. Oh, very interesting. Look at this pawn on c7. Believe it or not, that pawn can be attacked. White is better here. That pawn can be attacked with this move, bishop d2. This also prevents a5. You're going to a5 with the bishop. So let's say black plays a neutral move, bishop a5. Now you might say, how hard is this pawn to defend? Very hard. If c6, bishop c7 wins. If rook c8, bishop a6. So black has to resort to this nasty little move. And now, as I said, we immediately switch our attention to the center, rook h1. And black's position is very uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. It, it's hard to make a move here for black. Black is very tied down. So, for example, let's say black plays bishop c6, right? And now e5. Now we strike at the center. Now, obviously, you should see that bishop g2 ed is winning for white because of the back rank issues. So black has to basically support the rook on, e, on e8 with king f8. And now simply bishop f1. Look how the engine plays it. Every move attacks something. What you are trying to achieve is to lure black into this structure. Now black is saddled with, you know, these massive weaknesses on the queen side. And you might say, well, what about the e-pawn? Yeah, you have to give something up. You can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs, but it's about plus minus. Black has an empty check on g5. That doesn't do anything. You just tuck your king away on b2. Then you can also go bishop c4, bishop d5, and trade off black's strong piece. Really instructive to see how the engine handles these positions. So our opponent played a5. A4 is a good move. White is better. Bishop c3. Top engine move, by the way. Bishop c4. The idea is to play rook d3. Black goes bishop e6. And this, I think, may be an inaccuracy, but we're not going to focus on it. I think bishop e6 is very reasonable. So rook d3. Bishop b4. Bishop takes c6. F takes c6. And here I made a mistake. Here I made a mistake. We are almost winning with the move c3. 
Now, who can tell me... Let me refresh because I got disconnected. Who can tell me, why did I not play c3? I saw this move, and at first blush, it may seem that c3 traps the bishop or forces black to play bishop c5, and then black gets triple pawns. But what does black actually do here? It's just that I underestimated this. I, oh my god, this is beautiful. Beautiful idea that I missed. So instructive. The check. But what does black do here that I was afraid of? Because we are threatening to play rook a1 and force bishop c5, which would triple black's pawns. What is the point of black's play here? Oh, this is incredible. C5? No, come on. What do you mean C5? D5. Black has to play D5. No, you, you have to pay attention to what's going on. If black castles, we force this structure. I mean, look at this. This is a disaster. Black is losing here. No, black has to open up a diagonal for his bishop with D5. Okay? But now there is an incredible idea. B4. A takes B4. I saw this. What did I think? I thought that we have to play like this, and I saw the black and go b3 check, and again the bishop evacuates. But here there is a crazy computer idea that wins the game. Does anybody see it? Let's see who can find it. This is so instructive. There is actually two good moves here, but one idea wins the game. It's actually not king b3. King b3 is winning, but even better is cb. You're like, doesn't that defeat the whole purpose of what we just did? Now look at black's, Brooke and look at black's bishop. Suddenly you go rook b1, and it all seems very simple. King d7, rook db3, c5, bang, bishop c5. That's it. You win the rook in the corner. You literally just go cb, and you exploit this rook on b8 and the fact that black's rooks are uncoordinated. And then either rook b3 or rook b1 winning the game. And I missed this. I missed, I missed the whole concept of either going king b3 or going cb. I did not take this idea seriously enough. Because I wasn't really looking for tactics. I was already in my mind, psychologically, intent on playing positionally. And this was a very instructive mistake. So I went king b2 to prepare c3. But this gave black the time that he needed to open up the pathway back for the bishop. And now the game continues. Not easy to find at all. Not easy to find. What does king b3 do as sorrow goes? So again, king b3 is not the best move. King b3, very simple. You're preventing b3. Black is threatening to play b3 here and get the bishop out of there. You are physically preventing it. What is white's next move going to be here? Who can tell me? Let's say black plays, you know, something like king d7. What is uh, white's next move likely to be? Yeah, it's going to be bishop c5 and cb. The reason this is not so simple is because black can play this move. And if you play cb, suddenly it's a swindle. Takes, takes, and rook hb8. And then c5 if necessary. So, okay, this is complicated, but the engine gives this move. You basically leave the black bishop in the dust. So you're not playing to trap the bishop. You are playing to leave the bishop imprisoned so that black is effectively playing a piece down on the other side of the board. Super, super instructive. I missed it. I went king b2. After d5, f3 castles. Okay, white is only slightly better. Rook hd1, or clearly better, but not winning. h6, and bishop d2, the next stage. Very strong move, I think leaving or forcing the trade of bishops and making it easier for us to attack black's weaknesses on the queen side okay king f7 trade now of course black could play a takes before here maybe this was more resilient but this gives us this incredible long-term trump card in the form of a a protected passer on on a4 what we do what would we do here probably we would play the move uh rook c1 and then quickly c3 to open up the C file and target black's weak pawns on the C file. Okay? So rook b4 is what most people would play. Rook c3, rook b6, rook c5, rook a6, and ed, ed, c4. Bang. Opening up another front. And at this point, black's position is lost, I think. King e6, cd, king d6. How would you go about finding moves like c3 in a classical game? Well, you just have to consider it because the bishop is almost trapped. I should have spent longer considering this move because... It, I mean, if you see before, then you should look at it. Because if this works, then it wins the bishop. So lines that have such a high benefit, if they work, should be, you should devote more time to them. You should be more stubborn. Uh, but no, there's no way to guarantee that you find something like this. It just exists. There's no formula. Otherwise, everybody would find it. Okay, rook hd1, bishop d2, trade, attack the, the, the pawn, attack the pawn and force black to be even more passive. And now ed, ed, c4. Why did we need to play e takes d5? Because if we had gone c4 immediately, we give black the bailout option of playing d takes c4. And we certainly do not want to give black the free f file. 
Also, notice that the fifth rank is not as accessible to the black rook. So it's very important to first take on d5 and then play c4. And obviously, I think black probably should have gone dc, but this position is miserable. Absolutely miserable. Um, rook takes c4, and we are threatening rook d7. So the engine line is rook e8, rook d7, rook e7, trade, and we get a very similar position to what we got in the game. White, white should be technically winning. Yeah, back in speedrun mode. So CD King D6, and I think this was a critical moment where, yeah, I made a mistake here. Very interesting. I made a mistake here. Rook takes C6 gives away a good part of the... Okay, it's still winning, but it's much, much harder to convert. Um, Rook DC1 was correct. It's plus three. The reason I didn't like this is because it gives black the passer, but it turns out that black just cannot survive. So for example, black goes G5, and now you swing Rook H7, King E5, check. If king f4, then you go rook d7. And look at just how you you basically attack black's weaknesses, and black is too overextended to defend. Who can find the beautiful win after rook f5? There is a lovely win here for white. Pause the video and see if you can find it. Again, always looking for tactics, even when you are in quote-unquote convert mode. Okay, g3, king f3, rook f1, king g4. If king e4, then rook e7, rook e5, rook e1 is a classic, attacking the rook from both sides. But if king g4, you have to see this move, h3. And you you disattach the king from the rook and win. So this wins for white, because white wins the d-pawn. If the king goes the other way, right? If the king goes to d4, then you go from behind. Same technique. You go one rook from behind, then the other rook from in front. And king c5, you can try to dislodge the rook with g4. Rook e5, and rook b7. And then you go rook b5. And black is completely tied down. Black has basically no moves. It's Zugzwang. After king c6, rook b5, black is basically in Zugzwang. And then you can go, like, let's say king d6, you can go rook d3. Black has to shuffle. And then you walk your king up, king c3, king d6, and king d4. Look at how methodically the engine converts this position. King e6, and we go back to b8 and win the game. Because this is unstoppable, or this is unstoppable. So, just instructive to see how you make one improving move after the other. But I underestimated this. I underestimated how bad Black's king was. And how weak these two pawns are on uh, on h6 and on, on d5. So I didn't devote sufficient attention to this idea. Instead, we decided to trade like this. And here I think that the conversion is much harder. I have to commend our opponent on playing super well. So rook f5, rook e4. First thing we do is we centralize the rook. We put it on an optimal square. Then we bring our king up, king c3, h5. I actually think that this, this no-brainer move h4 was a mistake. Yeah, h4 was a mistake. Very instructive mistake. Why did not we try to go rook e7? The reason I didn't go rook e7 here is because it doesn't do anything. You should not automatically put the rook on the 7th rank. It's not always that good. Here black has the move rook g5, but it was correct. Rook g5, g4. We should have gone like this. You're right. We should have gone rook e7 here. I was somehow skeptical of this move h5. But does anybody see what white can do here to basically win the game on the spot? You can freeze black with this very important technique. What is it? h4. Yeah, h4. Rook g6, g5. Just look at this very carefully. The rook cannot move. What is white's plan? Well, you're just going to go f4 and f5. And where do we go if black goes king d6? Very instructive point. You go rook f7. You need to prevent the black king from being able to assist the rook. And you win the game, obviously. So somehow I was afraid of ghosts. What happens if black plays g5, then rook e6, rook h6? Stupid. I completely forgot about this move. I, and I just didn't appreciate it. And the, But the real mistake is h4 because it allows g5. And what you might say, well, why is this a mistake? Like, why does this favor black? Because if you look at this position, suddenly the g2 pawn is a weakness. And this is premature. You don't want to put your cards on the table too soon on the king side. Why not? Because you want to basically leave black with potential targets until you are ready to make a, a, a pass pawn. And we're not ready yet to make a pass pawn. So the correct move would have been to give this check first. And after king e6, you just continue to make improving moves with king c4. And black is busted. Black has no moves here. Because rook e5, rook e4 is a winning pawn endgame. Probably our opponent would continue to push his pawns. And now we play h4. 
What is the difference? Well, the difference is immense. Here, let's compare this position to this position. Here, after HGFG, black can play C5, and it's absolutely not clear how to make progress. Meanwhile, here, we play F4. We can play the move F4 using the fact that we're aiming at the h5 pawn. And look at this position carefully. White is winning because black cannot defend a5. Rook f2. You can even go king b5. This is kind of advanced, but white is winning here. And now king c6. Really pretty. Rook f3. Rook takes a5. Rook takes b3. And rook c5. It's not necessarily elementary to you that black is winning, but white is winning, but white is because the king is too far away. So already the technique is much harder. Rook e4 was a big mistake. I should have gone with my chance and gone rook e7. Already here you have to be super precise. Now, after b4, it should be a draw. a b4, king b4, gh4, king c6. Good move, king c4. Yeah, now it's a draw. g4 takes takes. Rook c5, king d3. Let me tell you where black went wrong. I'm going to tell you where black went wrong. Wow. Wow. This is a decisive mistake because of f4, apparently. But that's hard to see. Apparently, the drawing move is king b6. f4, c5. And you'll be able to tell how hard this is just by the engine line. Rook e4. And now you go back to c6. If white continues to push, you go king d7. Absolutely not obvious. Like, why is this a draw? c4 check. Oh, my God. This is what I'm talking about. You sack the pawn and win it back on the other side. And it's because of this that this is a draw. Otherwise, it's lost. So, like, okay, to find this king b6, c5, how do you know when to do that? Our opponent played a completely natural move, rook e5. Here, I made another mistake. Here, I made another mistake. And the winning move was f4. I didn't play it because of rook, because of rook e1. But apparently, this is winning because I have him cut off along this file. King c5, rook f4. Ah, you put the rook behind the pawn. So, white has to go like this, or black has to go like this. And now you go king e4. King c5. Okay, question. Where should white's rook go? This is an idea that I completely overlooked. What should white do in this position? End games are insanely hard. Insanely hard. Rook d3. With what idea? To play rook d3 to f3 and dislodge the rook. Now, everybody in this chat should know that you should put rooks in front of pass pawns. So that is the goal here. And black is not in time, right? If black says, oh, I'm going to start pushing my c pawn. No, you're not. You're just not fast enough. By like, actually by like two temp because white promotes with check. Uh, so f4, I played rook e4 and this gives black a tempo. But apparently king b6 is a decisive mistake. After f4, white is winning. The drawing move here was rook h5. I mean, how do you know to play this move? You don't. f4, king d5. You need to keep your king in the vicinity of the center. Rook d4, king e6. And black basically holds on the fifth rank. White has no way to make progress. That's the point. So rook h5, white has no way to make progress here. The difference, the difference is that if black tries to do the same thing here, he's not fast enough because you go king e4 and you make it, make it through to f5. Whereas if you compare this to the game continuation, here you're not making the move f5 in time. Black's king is much better positioned. So that's about it. King b6, f4, and now it's lost. Now it's lost because we're going to start pushing the f pawn. c5, and now this very nice technique, rook e6, rook e5. This one you should remember. This one you should remember because it, it, it forces black to lose contact between the king and the pawn. That's why we don't go rook e5 immediately here. Because here, black can go rook d1 and defend from behind. We have to check first and then go rook e5 so that we can win the c pawn. And this is always losing. H here you have trousers. You have pass pawns on either side of the board, and you win the game. And at this point, we're completely winning. That's it. This end game, I'm not going to delve into because we're at a high level in the speedrun, and I always tailor my comments to the level we're at. This is completely winning, and you should be comfortable converting it. The basic idea is you advance your king and then advance your pawn, which is exactly what we did. You just advance your king and advance your pawn, and then you hide the king behind the pawn. This is like the one thing you should just remember. Then you push it to f7. And we don't even need the Lucina position where you basically build a bridge and walk your king back. You just go rook e8 and king e7. If black's king were on c7 here, this would not work because black would start checking you. Although even here it works. So this is just even more winning. And now we just zigzag. Just avoid this. As long as you avoid this, 
You can keep zigzagging because the pawn defends the rook, and otherwise we promote. And that's it. So the actual decisive mistake for black, according to the engine, was this move king b6. Because it moves the king away from the center, and black should chill in the center here to be able to meet f4 with king d5. Okay? So really rich endgame with a lot of positional details, but I'm pretty exhausted, so I'm going to call it here. Important ideas included, first of all, b3 and a4, the concept of fixing your opponent's weakness on a square where you can attack it. Then, okay, we had this beautiful c3 idea, but transforming the advantage, right? Trading off the bishops to, in order to improve access to the other weaknesses, tying our opponent down, and then opening up a second front as my coach would call it, opening up a second front. You have your opponent tied down, and then you create more problems, sometimes by opening up the center or opening up files, and that makes it impossible for your opponent to defend because he's already so tied down to the existing weaknesses. Then, of course, we had to go rook dc1, appreciating the power of the, the rook tandem. And then there were a lot of mistakes in this endgame. Like, I didn't go here. I rushed h4, although this is much harder to understand. And then it should have been a draw. It should have been a draw with this, um, yeah, with uh, with king b6 and c5, but our opponent made a mistake. I made a mistake. So obviously these end games are almost impossible to play accurately, which is why I'm going to forgive myself. Thank you, Codesil, for the tier one. And I hope you enjoyed the game. That's about it. Belgrade Gambit really holds up at this level. It's very high level, but it still holds up. And next time we will try the move bishop c4. So, sorry, here we will try bishop c4. And then this whole like e5, bishop g5 line is definitely worth investigating. All right, guys, I got to head out. Um, I'll see everybody later. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the speedrun. This will be out on YouTube. Thank you for your support. Thank you, everybody. Peace.